Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Apologize for the delay in our hybrid setup here. Nod if you can hear me and I can see all of you. That's great. Um, my name is Allison Lake. I'm the Executive Director of Westchester Children's Association. We have many good partners here in the room and on the virtual screen today. And again, appreciate uh, your patience. This is a first hybrid event for Westchester Children's Association and a lot of logistics to make sure it all comes together. So appreciate your, your patience. Um, a little housekeeping. I think it's best if you have your screen um, on speaker view. So we do have several panelists and a presentation and that way um, you can see, see the main person speaking. And uh, we ask that all um, through the event, you keep your audio on mute so we don't have any um, interference. That would be great. There will be a chance near the end to put questions that you may have into the chat box and we have a staff person that will be monitoring that. So I think that's it for the housekeeping. Again, welcome to our panelists. I wanna thank Manhattanville College for hosting us. I want to thank the Westchester Women's Bar Association Foundation as one of the sponsors for this afternoon's event. It takes all of that, it takes that village to put things together. Um, and really come to life. So I know many of you know Westchester Children's Association, but those of you who do not, we are a multi-issue children's advocacy organization. Um, we work to ensure that all children, youth, and young adults, zero to 25, are healthy, safe, and prepared for life's challenges, regardless of race or zip code. We do that by investigating the needs of children, making those needs known to uh, decision makers and our elected officials, and then with many of you mobilized to see that their needs are met. And so today is just one example of how WCA convenes those who are in decision-making um, seats and then the, the public to help us mobilize and push forward our agenda for young people. Westchester Children's Association with many of you and many statewide partners have been involved in youth justice work for several years. We led the effort here in Westchester County to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 18 years of age. And again, I recognize many partners that helped us um, do that for the state. More recently, with our state partners, we involved in advocacy that raised the lower age of juvenile delinquency from seven to 12. Um, ending finally the arrest and prosecution of those children under 12 years of age, and it gave a second chance for the youthful offender, which allows adolescents and teenagers to have their records sealed. So there's been a lot of good progress around um, youth justice, but there certainly is more work to be done. And we're all here this afternoon to really see and hear and learn some lessons and some opportunities to help us move that agenda forward. Um, emerging adults, which is our theme and the concentrating population that we're going to concentrate on this afternoon, those are 16 and 17 year olds. And I think that we will all agree that they are in need and deserve our attention and our commitment um, to help move them forward, to meet them where they are and give them the resources and supports they need to move forward in their life. You're going to have a chance to hear about alternatives age-appropriate alternatives to incarceration that really allow young people to change the trajectory of their life. And as child advocates, that's what we're about. And I'm assuming that if you've joined us today, that you too are passionate about giving young people a second chance. We hear later from a great um, statewide partner, Kate Rubin from Youth Represent, on how you can work with WCA and other partners to move forward a broader youth um, advocacy agenda. And I will say from the start that I'm going to ask all of us to be bold in our actions as we think of the year ahead. So I'm pleased now to turn over the mic. Um, fingers crossed that it all works the way we think it's supposed to work uh, to two interns that work with us to put together this afternoon's um, presentation. We have uh, Jose Aizazaga, a student at the John Jay College, 
and Sherry Quinn, who is a social work um, student from Mercy College. And they're going to both read brief uh, bios from our um, panelists, and then we will turn it over and begin to moderate the panel um, here today. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your, your patience as we got things together this afternoon and really looking forward to a good conversation and uh, robust discussion on what we can do for our young people. So welcome and thank you. Uh, thank you, Allison, for that. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Jose Zaga. I'm born and raised from New Rochelle. I'm an OIP participant and also a junior at John Jay College. I'm first generation Mexican American. So I plan on becoming the first in my family to graduate college and also become a police officer. So I'm happy to introduce two of our panelists with us today. And first up, we have the New Rochelle City Court Judge Jared Rice, who joined the court in January 2020 after being on the New Rochelle City Council since 2011. Previously, Judge Rice was a public defender in the Mount Vernon City Court for more than 12 years and worked alongside his father at the Rice and Rice Law Firm. He led the effort to make New Rochelle the first community in the county to accept Barack Obama's My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge. And at City Court, Judge Rice has launched a new opportunity youth part of City Court, which is close to celebrating its one year anniversary. Thank you for being here, Judge Rice. Thank you, salute, young man. <laughs> uh, secondly, we have Ms. Miriam uh, Roca, who is the Westchester County District Attorney since January, 2021, and has been focused on reforming and modernizing the Westchester County DA's office, rebuilding trust between law enforcement and communities it serves, fighting for a safer and fairer criminal justice system for all of Westchester from transparency to accountability and conviction integrity to reducing gun violence and better addressing mental health issues. DA Roca's vision for the DA's office is based on her 16 years career as an assistant US attorney from 2001 to 2017 in the Southern District of New York. And now I'll pass it on to Sheree. I think you're muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you, Jose, for that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to thank um, you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Cherie. Um, I'm currently a senior in the BSW program. Um, and currently, I am the social work intern here at the Westchester Children's Association. And I have decided to intern with the WCA to understand the impact of social policy has at, on at-risk populations such as youth involved in criminal justice system. And my, goals, um, and my goals include advocacy for children and youth and needs of services. So um, now I would like to introduce uh, two panelists. Um, first, it's going to be honor Judge Edwina Middleson. And she is currently the New York Deputy uh, Chief Administrative Judge. She oversees the, the, the NYS Unified Court System, Office of Justice Initiatives, and Office of Policy and Planning. And planning sorry. Um, Judge Mendelson also leads the equal, the equal Justice and Court Incentives and directs several juvenile and family justice in, initiatives. Judge Middleton also served in the New York City court system for several decades and is working to ensure meaningful access to justice for all New Yorkers in civil, criminal, and family courts. Her work strongly incorporates justice for all people regardless of income, background, or, and or special needs. So uh, now I would like to introduce the second panelist, which is Ms. Tamika Coverdale. Is, she is a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, senior trial and counsel at the Legal Aid Society of Westchester County. In January of 2021, she was appointed to the diversity, equity, and inclusion officer with, with the office. On June 1st, 
2021, Ms. Coverdale was appointed to serve on the New York State Bars Association Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She prides herself in connecting through her community and is dedicated to giving back to her community, along with her direct, her executive di director, Claire Delegan. Ms. Coverdale was a part of a team that worked with the Westchester County District Attorney's Office to create contracts for emerging adults justice and part in Mount Vernon City Court. Thank you and thank you for having me today. Thank you, Cherie. Thank you, Jose. Uh, my name is Josh Prywas. I am the program policy manager here at Westchester Children's Association. And I want to thank everyone for being with us. And again, like Allison said, we had a little bit of a technology situation, but we are good now. Um, and I want to just do a couple of quick uh, notes before we get started. And we have a great panel for you, as you can tell from their bio. So we are, we are pretty much ready to get started. I wanted to just say that um, you know, in terms of this conversation, we're really gonna to try to orient it around action steps and what are some of the things that we can take away from this discussion and to Allison's point, bring back to our advocacy at Westchester Children's Association and more broadly on the county level. Um, couple of reminders, just to keep yourself on mute if you're not speaking as part of the program. Uh, we will have a Q and A section, so you will have an opportunity to contribute to this conversation, but we encourage you to put those Q and A in the chat. Um, the in-person group will also have an opportunity for Q&A. And then uh, last but not least, to keep yourself on speaker view so you can see us uh, in the room and also the panelists speaking on the Zoom. So with that, we're gonna get started. Um, I'm honored to start with Judge Mendelson in terms of the statewide perspective. Um, so our question for you, and as we kind of get our footing with the emerging adult age group in, in Westchester County and more broadly at New York State in the justice system, can you provide an overview of the emerging adult population in the, the youth justice system in New York State uh, from a historical perspective, but then also um, what kinds of interventions have you seen for successfully reintegrating young people into community and reducing recidivism? So I have no idea where to look. I'm looking at <laughs> wonderful people in this room. I'm looking at a screen, but every time I look at the screen, it looks like I'm looking at the sky. And then I've got my colleagues over here. So forgive me in advance. I'm just gonna look all over the place and begin by thanking you all for inviting me to participate in this really important conversation. And that's what I'm hoping this is, a conversation and a discussion. I'm a judge statewide deputy chief administrative judge for justice initiatives. And thank you, Cherie and Jose for those wonderful introductions of us. I taught at John Jay College uh, uh, for 10 years. So Jose, you are doing uh, that school very, very proud by your actions. And Cherie, I know you will go very, very far. So thank you for your participation in this and your willingness to serve. Um, my job as statewide deputy chief administrative judge for justice initiatives for the state court system is to oversee a number of endeavors and one of them is youth and emerging adult justice policy work for our court system. I, uh, like many in this room, uh, was deeply involved in our state court, our state joining the rest of the country in raising the age of criminal responsibility. And that was a major lift. And we utilized science, developmental uh, sciences, uh, sociology and neurobiology to inform us and teach us what we needed to know to raise the age of criminal responsibility in New York State and to do it with success. That same science is has we have brought that to the emerging adult justice uh, work that we are all trying to do. But in grounding us about what emerging adult justice is and what it may mean in terms of action steps that you're calling us to engage in, I just want to remind folks that this is new. The science that we are guided by in trying to promote justice for our children and young adults in the state of New York the science has been there for quite a while and applying it to adolescence, we know how to do and we have been doing and we've done it successfully with raising age. The scientists that I have learned from, the researchers, 
uh, and people who are doing, and we're not doing this alone. There is a national movement to focus on the emerging adult population. So New York is joining this national movement. We have been advised to apply that same science that guided us so well as we raise the age of criminal responsibility to the emerging adult population. So I give that as um, some context to actually now answering your question because I started by saying I'm a judge, which means I get to answer any question I want and rephrase the question. That's what judges do. Judge Rice is gonna do the same thing when it's his turn. I thought it important to set the context before I address your question. Now, it's a new application of important scientific work to a population that needs attention and intervention. It either, depending on how you define it, it's the 18 to 25 year old uh, emerging adult population. When I was working with the Columbia Justice Lab in New York, which is a remarkable resource for all of us in terms of uh, action papers and research papers, and they'll come and present to organizations as we move forward in our equal, just, uh, equal emerging adult justice space. When I was part of their collaborative learning community for three years, judges, legislators, researchers, and practitioners in corrections and courts from all over the country, we were told that we, what we would be doing, what Judge Rice is doing in his, in his courtroom and what others are doing in, in Mount Vernon, New York, New York, and Brooklyn, New York, where we began our emerging adult justice work was critically important. And we were asked to focus on certain things to try to help the emerging adult population. When I first joined the Columbia Justice Lab, I told them, no, it's not 18 to 25, it's 16. We had not yet raised the age of criminal responsibility. But the science that we use is the same. The same things that we know about the young people that put them at such risk when they're adolescents applies to our emerging adult population. And we believe that appropriate interventions are, um, will be successful and we're studying it as we apply this new science. What makes the emerging adult population um, one worthy of focus? Well, first of all, they may be 10% of our population in our state. That's not a huge percent of po the population, but they, could, um, we're told in New York State, are responsible for 25% of the arrests. And nationally, it's 30, close to the 30% of the arrests, even though they represent 10% of the population. So that by their numbers, they are more actively engaged in um, a, a, um, activity that is defined as criminal activity in our communities. And the other area why we need to focus on the emerging adult population is they have some of the worst outcomes possible, no matter how you define an outcome uh, in a criminal court process in terms of lengths of sentences, incarceration uh, as opposed to being at liberty, um, being confined as opposed to being released, and they have the highest rates. The younger people, 25 and below, um, have the highest rates of recidivism. So that's why it's worth it if you care about our communities and you care about the young people who are system involved and you care about their families, um, you're going to want to create interventions. And the particular interventions are the types that we are seeing in all of our emerging adult courts. A, a figure, either a judge or a lead judge or a lead probation official that spends a lot of time repeatedly bringing the young people in, in back to court, making the youth who are part of the court process part have agency and be part of the solutions involved in their cases, recognizing that one size fits one, um, and definitely does not fit all. So the term would be to individuate what resources might help this particular young person. And importantly, making sure the community is involved in terms of community resources to support the work. Thank you. That was a wonderful answer. And I really liked how you gave a lot of context and then kind of teed it up to our other panelists today in terms of some of their work. Um, and it sets the stage so well. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to our Zoom friends here uh, with DA Roca, District Attorney Roca for Westchester County. Um, so we're going to pivot and ask about the DA's office in terms of how it approaches this emerging adult age group uh, and working with other county partners on innovative solutions like the Mount Vernon Emerging Adult Justice Court, which I believe Judge Mendelson briefly mentioned as well. And thank you in advance. 
Um, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here with um, all of these um, amazing partners in, in this uh, area and, and so many other areas that we're working on together. Um, and I want to just note that Anthony Moley um, from my office is also, I think he's at the top of the screen there, um, looking down on me, uh, making sure that I get everything right. And we'll jump in on some questions as well. Anthony is the division chief for our local uh, branch division. So he oversees um, the branches that really are, you know, sort of um, on the ground doing the day-to-day -day work um, in these areas that we're talking about. Um, so to turn to um, the question that you asked, um, we are collaborating um, with partners, um, many of them here on this Zoom, um, in this area. I would say Mount Vernon, uh, the emerging adult justice part, you know, is, is quite quite new and um, pretty well established though at this point, new in terms of our um, involvement and the, the um, iteration that, it, that it's in right now. Um, our main partner, obviously partners are the Mount Vernon City Court um, and the Youth Shelter of Westchester. Um, the way that it works, um, we announced it this summer and the way that it's been working is that young people between the ages of 18 and 25 who are charged with misdemeanors, um, vehicle and traffic offenses other than DWI, um, violations and certain nonviolent felonies um, are eligible for the program. Um, we have established with our partners uh, a pretty extensive, detailed, very well thought out uh, manual and procedures to formalize the collaboration um, and, and I should have mentioned, obviously, Legal Aid is um, a, a main partner in this as well. Um, you know, it's really a, a collaboration between us and the courts and Legal Aid and our community partner, the Youth Shelter of Westchester. Um, so we have uh, to date referred 21 individuals, um, 10 of whom have consented to participating in the initial assessment completed it and been formally accepted in. And remember, this is just since this summer. Um, so obviously the program is, is you know, growing um, every, every month. Um, and we still have uh, 10 others who are still in the initial assessment phase. Um, the participants are once accepted are offered really just a multitude of wonderful programs um, really through the youth shelter. Um, and that is uh, mental health, uh, substance abuse treatment, GED prep uh, and testing, um, OSHA and HVAC training, soft skills training, which includes job readiness workshops, um, employment assistance, digital equity, um, they're given a Chromebook and training on how to use the Chromebook, how to build a resume. I mean, we could, we could spend quite a bit of time talking um, about these skills um, and housing, if it's an issue, which it is for some of our participants, um, the youth shelter also assists with that. I mean, when I first started hearing about all these services provided um, from our ADAs, I, I really was floored. And I, I really, again, wanna just give so much credit to um, the youth shelter of Westchester, who has just absolutely um, been an amazing, amazing partner in, in this. Um, and we're looking, frankly, to expand these offerings um, for this kind of court. The city of Yonkers has recently expressed an interest in offering a Yonkers justice part, um, and then sort of separate, um, but um, in uh, related, um, we started a program recently called Fresh Start, um, which obviously by its name comes from the idea that people deserve second ch chances, um, a fresh start, and that incarceration is simply not always the right answer. Um, the idea is to try to get away from this destructive cycle for people who are arrested of low level crimes, um, which I, I probably don't need to tell this audience, but obviously you can go to jail for even minor offenses, you lose jobs, um, have a criminal conviction, makes it difficult to get housing, loans, education, 
Um, and so in the long run, it's, it's obviously very damaging to individuals, particularly in this young emerging adult population. Um, and it also leads to over-incarceration of people of color, and it does very little to keep people, in fact, it, it can have adverse consequences sometimes in, in terms of keeping uh, recidivism down and people out of jail. So with the launch of Fresh Start, um, we are offering the, a path for people to choose to take on consent with their lawyer uh, that will provide guidance and mentorship and um, uh, access to services through the County Department of Community Mental Health um, instead of conviction, incarceration, and fines. We're starting it right now in uh, Greenberg and White Plains as pilot projects. Again, the Westchester um, Legal Aid Society is, is a partner in this as well. Um, it, we are starting with first-time low-level offenses like disorderly conduct, pettit larceny, trespassing, etc. Um, but this is an area where not specifically focusing on the age population we're talking about, it obviously will end up capturing quite a bit that population and hopefully being extremely helpful in that age group, in, in this age group that we're talking about in particular, because it's a way to avoid that, that vicious cycle that starts often at this age. Um, the other two areas that I would mention where, um, again, it's not specifically focused on this age group, but will hopefully have a great impact, is that our drug hub courts um, that operate through the city courts and allow services and programming, um, we, we allow them to, to, we allow participants from more than just those individual city courts so that it can um, reach a broader audience across the county. Um, we are also working with our court system to develop a misdemeanor mental health court, which would be the first in the county, which I think, again, will um, provide hopefully um, mental uh, illness type of services to a, a, a much greater population. And again, I think it will really positively impact um, young people in, in particular. So those are some of the different ways, in addition, obviously, to New Rochelle, which I know Judge Rice is going to talk about, um, that, that we are doing other um, areas that, to try to seek a greater positive impact through the, through the criminal justice system, which is a weird thing to say, but here we are, um, for young people. Thank you, DA Roca, and, you know, appreciate you elaborating on some of the great work across the county. Um, there, there are just so many partners involved with this work, and, and it's, a, it's a blessing to this county to have many of them uh, on this call in this room. We know there are many others who are not in the room, and, and we're appreciative of everything that they are doing as well for this population. Um, so with that, we're, we're continuing on with our introductory questions to various panelists. So with, with that, Judge Rice, um, the New Rochelle City Court has done a wonderful job in terms of the Opportunity Youth Park that you actually founded. Um, so we wanted to ask you around, you know, to provide a brief overview of the OIP, um, some of the specific trends that you've seen, you know, since it was founded about one year ago, uh, next week, I believe, which is a great milestone, um, as well as some of the lessons learned that, that you have seen. Well, thank you for that, Josh, and hello to everyone on the screen. I'm having this issue as well, looking up and not knowing where to look. But it's a beautiful day outside, and, you know, we are all happy to be here. I want to give a shout out to Allison Lake with the Westchester Children's Association. She and I actually go back to the days of Raise the Age when I was a young attorney just trying to find my way. I was in the Mount Vernon City Court, and at the time, we had a program called the Adolescent Diversion Program. I was the lead attorney from 2012 to 2019 focused solely on 16 and 17 year olds. And this is in the pre-raised age days. So what we did was took the 16, 17 year olds who came to Mount Vernon City Court. We had our own special park and we had it from the beginning to the end. I remember the day when our last participant was with us and we faded away where we let the family court just take over. And now looking at it two years later, I just find it shocking that we would actually have 16 and 17 year olds in criminal court for petty larceny and marijuana possession and so on and so forth. And I hope that this discussion that we have today surrounding emerging adult justice becomes one of those where we look back at this time and said, we just got it wrong. And you know what? The best thing about being wrong is that means that you're learning and we all need to be learning every day. And that's something that we're all striving to get better at. I want to give a shout out to Jose Izazaga. He is one of our participants. 
He is one of our all-stars. We have our one-year anniversary coming up on October 29th. This is after 100 people have been serviced. Uh, we have about 60 to 70 participants who are actively with us. And Jose has made the cut. He's one of our 13 all-stars. He has done tremendous work outside of the court and we are really pleased with his greatness. And that's the thing with OYP, the opportunity youth part. What we want to do is find the greatness in these young people, but you cannot do so unless if you take the time to learn who they are. They are more than what they read on the accusatory instrument. They are more than what you see in the arraignment at a bail application. There is much more to them. And what we do with our OYP family, we're more than a team, we're a family. We work with these young people week in and week out. And through the joys of, of the work that we do, we've been able to successfully move these young people along because they, we know that they are part of our community and our community cannot be strong unless those individuals who are most vulnerable are strong along with us. So OYP started a year ago. I was a new judge. Um, the pandemic just hit. It took us out of commission for about two, three, four months. We came back to court in July or August and myself, and at the time, the branch chief of the district attorney's office, Tony Ann Gagliardi, Kevin Jones, also in the New York district attorney's office, Courtney McGowan, the Society, Cynthia Lobo, a public defender, 18B attorney, and Dan Bonet and Phil Mallory from the Guidance Center. We got in my chambers. We had about one to two to three cases. We would meet at nine o'clock in the morning in my chambers, and we would talk about cases. We would learn more about the young people. We would figure out what's going on. And one case turned to two, two turned to four, four turned to six. And after a while, the court officers would start knocking on my door and said, Judge, you know, we have a really busy courtroom out there and we need to get this going. So what we did was said, let's put this on in the afternoon. Let's take this show in a row. Let's have a special design part called the Opportunity Youth Part where we can learn more about these young people because they have challenges. They have issues going on that go beyond what we know of them and what we expect them to do. And in doing so, I was fortunate enough to stumble upon Judge Mendelssohn's email. I sent her a blind email and said, Judge, you run this amazing office. How can we work with you here in New Rochelle? And she met with me. We had a virtual conference and I explained to her what we were doing. This is about August or so. She said, oh, you're doing emerging adult justice. I'm like, duh, I didn't know what this was called this whole time. And she got <laughs> it down for me right away. So from there, we were able to connect with the Columbia Justice Lab. We were able to connect with Center for Court Innovation. We were able to take all of our neighborhood partnerships from the West Cop to West Tab to Guidance Center to Lexington. And we were able to create something that just allowed us to flourish. So starting in October, we had our first set of young people that came into the park. And from there, we've been successively having cases move along. So it's rare to find a case in the North South City Court on a regular calendar with a young person because most of them, the majority of them are with us on Thursday afternoon. We do something unique. We incentivize them to come in. We provide them with options and services. And in some cases, we take advantage of the new bail reform law. I think the bail reform law is widely known for what it does. It allows certain classes of crime called non-qualifying offenses to prevent people from going to jail pre-trial for incarceration periods. But one of the unsung heroes of non-monetary conditions is this thing called non-monetary conditions of bail reform law. And with that, we are able to assess at arraignment and determine what level of flight risk one poses. And in doing so, we don't know all the time. So in New Rochelle, we have you go to Westcott, Dan Bonet, Stephanie Hotel, Karina Cortez, shout out to that amazing team there. They are doing this day in, day out. They are doing the work um, Monday to Friday, Saturday and Sunday in the evenings and in the mornings as well. And we bring them there for an assessment. We come back and we figure out what's the best wellness plan for this person. And language is critically important. Language really matters a lot. And when we talk about language, we talk about the term that we use for this part, the opportunity youth part. And if you look up the word opportunity, it means a set of circumstances that makes it possible to do something. I will posit here today that it is impossible to succeed without opportunity. And what we do is provide opportunity. That's what we do. That's why we do it. That's how we do it. That's when we do it. That's where we do it. That sums up the, the entirety of our work. And as we move forward in this conversation along today, you will see this theme of opportunity and you'll see how we roll and you'll see how we get things done. Shout out to everyone again. Thank you, Judge Rice. And, and you know, the work that you're doing and, and all the partners across New Rochelle and Westchester County, um, we're excited to kind of dig into that a little bit deeper 
with you today. Uh, so our last kind of introductory question is going to be for Ms. Tamika Coverdale from Legal Aid Society. Um, and, and we're going to ask you, um, as just an overview, to provide a little bit of some insight into the kind of the beginning interaction in terms of why um, you're seeing young people getting arrested and, and getting in contact with police. And then sort of the end kind of preventative framework in terms of what kinds of uh, strategies uh, does legal aid and do other partners across the county employ around uh, reducing recidivism and justice involvement for youth in the future? Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, you kind of jumbled my questions around, but that's fine uh, with me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, Judge Mendelson, Judge Rice, DA Roca. Um, and I would also like to say that I bring you greetings on behalf of the Legal Aid Society of Westchester, where my executive director, Claire Degnan, as well as my deputy uh, executive director, Sherry Wallach, are truly committed to the work that is being done in the emerging um, adult part in Mount Vernon, as well as the OYP part in New Rochelle. Also on is my colleague who is the region chief for New Rochelle City Court, and that is Courtney McGowan. I, I wanted to point out before I answer those questions that we have worked so well together, the district attorney's office, as well as the Legal Aid Society of Westchester. This has been a collaborative effort in the Mount Vernon um, emerging adult part. And, and why I say that, we worked together for months, months getting the getting things right so that we understood who would be eligible to go in and who would not be eligible to go in. And it was a pleasure working with uh, Executive Assistant D District Attorney uh, Lila Curtin, as well as Assistant District Attorney Anthony Moley, as well as Assistant District Attorney uh, Shamika Matherin. I mean, months we worked together and it was it was a great effort. And on those calls were also my executive director as well as my deputy executive director. Why do I bring that up? Well, I bring that up because it's important that our clients understand the process. They have to understand the process when they are to go into that part. Now, my office, we represent felonies, as most of you know, so there was a little tug of war, um, but we worked things out with Anthony as well as Shamika, and we got things right in determining who, um, what felonies would go in, and I think we all did a great job. It was a collaborative effort, but I would like to point out Judge Williams and Judge Johnson of Mount Vernon City Court. They worked with us though, during those months, and who's extremely important, who ha I have not mentioned, but she needs to be mentioned right now, is Executive Director Joanne Dunn of the Youth Shelter of Westchester. Extremely, extremely important in this process. Um, so I wanted to point that out. I also wanted to point out two other individuals, my colleague Megan Seltzer, as well as Andre Jermaine Archer, worked in this process. And it's not too often that the DA's office and the Legal Aid Society of Westchester work together in this fashion. But as DA Roca said, what we are now doing is we are working together in these emerging adult parts, as well as in the Fresh Start programs. That's extremely important. Um, and I believe, Josh, you asked me about preventative work, the preventative work that um, has been done. Well, what my office has done before the emerging adult part was actually formed, our office has gone and worked with Executive Director of the Youth Shelter, Joanne Dunn. At any time, she's allowed us or she has wanted us to come and speak to those who are in the aftercare program. And what do we do with them? We speak to them about knowing their rights so that this occurs before that there is any arrest. So that is preventative. If someone knows their rights beforehand, knows how to interact with the police prior to being stopped or if they are stopped, then there are cases that will not end up in our criminal justice system. We have also forged or um, we have relationships with the Department of Community Mental Health. We also have relationships with uh, Westchester Barber Academy, as well as we have taken those who do have not been arrested, this is preventative, on college visits with the youth shelter. When I say that our office is in a partnership with the youth shelter of Westchester, that is exactly what it is. At any time, uh, Joanne Dunn knows that she can call on us and we will be there, not when someone is arrested, but to speak to them beforehand. So that is extremely 
and uh, important to the work that we do in my office. So we do that preventative work so that we speak to them as well as those who do have prior uh, run-ins with the law. And what I say prior run-ins with the law, we speak about marijuana expungements. We speak about sealing of records. So that's extremely important in the work uh, that we do and we are dedicated to doing in my office. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coverdale. That was great in terms of <clears throat> giving a little bit more insight into you know, the collaboration with the youth shelter, which does such great work. You know, um, Ms. Joanne Dunn as well, and uh, many of the partners around that table in Mount Vernon are, are doing wonderful things as well. Um, and, you know, as we, as we kind of open this panel up a little bit, we just finished our introductory kinds of questions. We're going to open it up to more of a discussion with all of the panelists together. Um, and, and our next question is going to really be around racial equity, uh, factoring into some of the efforts to address the overrepresentation of Black and Latino young people in Westchester's justice system. So with that, I want to open it up to everyone um, as we, you know, think about that question, what kinds of, um, you know, efforts are you seeing or are you kind of looking towards for Westchester? So I'll start with, yeah, okay. So in New Rochelle City Court, we have a really diverse population of defendants. And what we've been able to do um, with this one year um, celebration of our anniversary is kind of compile some of the data. And the data of the 100 and plus young people who come to us, the 60 people who are with us today, and the 35 partner agencies that we work with day in and day out shows us that about 90% of the young people that are involved with us are Black or Latino. And that is about right, um, I think, for what we've been seeing throughout the court system in New Rochelle. And what do we want to do about that? I think that it goes back to some of the racial equity work that the court system has been doing, led by Judge Steve Yori, in light of the George Floyd situation. I think that the court situation is looking at ways to resolve some of its issues with racial equity. And for me, as a judge, somebody coming from a place where I was more public policy on the legislative side, I knew that I was no way, no longer able to march or to be an activist. And I wanted to take the skills I had and, and be able to be useful with them. So that's really what created this opportunity youth part. We were able to right away work with the district attorney's office and the defense bar and figure out ways to be not as traditional, right? Because I think when we talk about the criminal justice system, um, we kind of want to move away from criminal justice. And I think what we are creating in New Rochelle is more of a community justice model. We have several people, mentors, about 40 already, who have said enough is enough. And they want to share that social capital with young people. We have a lot of sayings that we have in our OIP. And one of those sayings is, your network is your net worth. And who you surround yourself with um, shows your potential in life. Another saying that we have is, broken people break things. And sometimes the things that they break are the laws, right? So we're learning all these things and we're learning all these different tools, but it comes down to the racial equity piece and the opportunities that are provided. We have different zip codes in New Rochelle and you can tell by which zip code, which opportunities will be presented to these young people. And when you kind of unpack their stories and unpack some of their lives, um, we find so much that has been on their plate from a trauma standpoint, but we've been so much um, outpouring with love with them, right? And, and we're trying to reach them where they are. So it's, you have to be intentional about it. You have to understand the racial dynamics of it. You have to understand the history uh, of this nation. And in doing so, you'll come to an outcome where uh, a better future is possible. May I follow up? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I thank Judge Rice for mentioning what the court system is trying to do in terms of racial equity. I think I need to say this. I like, I think this is what my role is here today to bring things back to the state and the nation and the broader picture. And I'm happy to be here to do that. Um, so Chief Judge DeFiori has um, established an Equal Justice and in Courts Initiative. And um, good news for me, um, I have been appointed by the Chief Judge to lead that initiative for our state court systems, where we are uh, straight on addressing racial equity issues and racism in our courts. We're doing all sorts of things, mandating bias training for our judges and all of our staff. Um, we have uh, established a uh, social media policy to make sure that there are not inappropriate social media communications 
We're working with our, our court officers and other staff to have heightened training and customer service and how we engage with the young people who are in, in uh, and not re-traumatizing them as they report to be. Um, though they have to go through uh, metal detectors and all of those types of things that, are, you know, are, are actually feel like a violation when you're a court user and necessary for our safety, there are ways to greet our public in a way that's respectful of them. So I'm pleased to lead that work, but I think that we have to remember that race equity has to be front and center to whatever it is that we're doing in our spaces of influence. Overrepresentation is a soft word when we talk about the um, complexion of the young people that we're dealing with in our courts. It's a national disgrace and it's also a state disgrace. And I assume it's locally the same in Westchester County. Um, in New York state, we have black, black people being 16% of the population, but over 40% of the arrests. When you look at those numbers, something simply isn't right about that. And these are not things that can be fixed overnight. These are systemic issues, they're institutional issues, and they're deep and they're thorny, but we have to call it out when we see it. When it comes to Latinos, it's, the disparity is still there, um, but it's not as, as vast. The, the numbers are like 22% of the population and 26% of the arrests. Still overrepresentation, right? Um, and I also, when we discuss, talk about race equity, that I ask us all to keep front and center, to not forget our girls, although it's mostly young men that are in these parts, court parts, so statistically you have fewer um, young women. Um, we find on a national, statewide, everywhere, that girls have harsher outcomes when they are justice system involved. So are we treating them worse because they are female in our system. So we have to watch that as well. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say, but I've got, I don't have an adolescent brain. I have the other end of the spectrum with my brain. Oh, this is the point I wanted to make. We talked about raise the age because that's the base. And sometimes raise the age and the young people in the juvenile justice system can feed into and lead to emerging adult justice. And we have, that's why we're doing all of these initiatives in your various areas of influence. We don't want to feed um, into the emerging adult justice system. I have to give credit to New York State though, because we keep pushing to do more and to do better. Over the last 20 years, we have reduced our juvenile justice and, and, and our criminal justice touch on children in a remarkable way. During the pandemic, there was one day, I think it was July of 2020, where we had zero uh, juvenile delinquency children in New York City in confinement, zero. We never had zero. After many, many years of effort and collaborative effort with um, um, community organizations, courts, and, and the advocates, we have reduced our juvenile justice touch by 70% in terms of the number, of, and, and it's really a straight line down when you look at all of the data in terms of arrests, in terms of confinement. But guess what? As we've reduced that touch, the disparities have grown. What? <laughs> That's troublesome. And so even though we, I'm happy with the efforts we've made, as we improve our system, the overrepresentation, too soft a word, find a different word, the overrepresentation grows. And the next level. Thank you. Um, I can jump in here. Um, so this has been um, a really big focus uh, for me since I took office um, and the team that I work with. And I, I want to just uh, give a shout out to Lila Curtin, uh, who uh, Tamika mentioned, um, who is uh, one of my executives and the executive on my team who uh, oversees a lot of these programs that we're talking about today and is um, really an indispensable part of my team um, in this area. And, and we've been very focused on um, trying to reduce racial disparities. And, um, you know, this is something that we, we talk about every day here. We um, give a lot of thought to. So some of the formal programs that we're working on um, obviously, as, as is being discussed, I think anything where we're talking about sort of helping young people to try and get them out of the criminal justice system before this cycle begins is in my mind 
also helping to work on, it's not just their age, but it does disproportionately impact um, particularly men, but, but also women, uh, young people of color. Um, we also um, have partnered with the Youth Shelter of Westchester again, and Joanne Dunn is on, so now I'll give her a huge shout out um, because she's a wonderful partner on so many things. Um, we partnered, we applied with uh, the Youth Shelter of Westchester for a Vera Institute um, grant. It's called uh, Motion for Justice Initiative. Uh, we were one of only 10 offices across the country that was chosen for this with our community partner. Um, and it basically is a initiative that is specifically designed to try to um, get better data analysis and um, insight and information into what the racial disparities are and where in the system. I've, I've, I've been saying for a while now, you know, I don't need someone to tell me that there are racial disparities, but I sure would like a better diagnosis of where in the system they're occurring and how they're impacting people because you can't fix a problem that you haven't well diagnosed, I think. Um, and so this program um, with Vera will help us do that. Um, we also hired the first um, data um, officer here uh, in the county and in, in this office for the first time, um, who is working not only on sort of modernizing our systems, but with a specific eye towards um, helping us collect this data on racial disparity and gender disparities, um, you know, in sex crimes cases, for example. And then as we do that, and we're not there yet, it's, it's going to take a while because there's a lot of modernizing and, and data collecting to do, but we want to be more transparent about it. We want to put that information out there to the public so that you um, communities, you know, can see it and can tell us what we're getting right and what we're getting wrong. Um, I think that Fresh Start, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a big uh, program in terms of, again, trying to impact or, or lessen the impact of this footprint of the criminal justice system on uh, people of color. Um, and, and I just want to say, though, that in addition to these kind of formal programs, and, and there are others, you know, I really think from a prosecutorial point of view, if someone who's trying to be more um, deliberate and conscious about changing this. It also just comes in the way we approach cases on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, cases that may not fall into any of these programs that we're talking about because they're serious, violent uh, felony offenses um, or, you know, uh, cases that, that, that at least initially are not part of these programs. But we really try to look at them with an eye of, okay, you know, what, who has gotten this plea offer before, for example? You know, is it, um, have we given this plea offer to a uh, young black male with a gun, the same one that we want to offer to the young white male with a gun, and vice versa? And I think we just, you know, have to be, it can, you know, it's, it's not an easy conversation necessarily to have in a prosecutor's office, but I'm, my team and I are trying to be more, conscious and deliberate in doing that and um, making those conversations part of our everyday deliberations um, that we have about cases. And I think that's something that needs to happen in prosecutor offices across the country more and more. Thank you. I just wanted to touch upon um, the point that DA Roca just mentioned regarding, okay, if you have an individual who may be arrested in one jurisdiction and they're white, are they treated the same way as an individual who's a black male in Yonkers, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle? My office will point that out. We, our attorneys don't have a problem pointing that out because that is our job. That is our role because we have to zealously advocate on behalf of these clients. And I can honestly say that DA Roca is willing to listen. Uh, you know, uh, ADA uh, Moldy is willing to listen. The office, Lala, they're willing to listen. And I think that's a start. And, and um, that is extremely important. Fresh Start is important because with the program such as Fresh Start, you're at some point attempting to level the playing field so that you have individuals who have their first arrest. They're not going to be caught up in that criminal justice system. And that's key because we want to stop that. We want to ensure 
that our young people have a fighting chance in life. They are so bright and they should not be hindered by you know, a conviction um, at all times. What is also um, important, and I'm looking at my notes right here, is recently, and I know many of you all know about this, but DA Roca, I mean, she threw out, I don't know the number of marijuana convictions, but there were so many marijuana convictions. My office, that that's special to us, expunging those uh, convictions. Um, but what's important is that now, and Judge Rice knows this, now he's not seeing those individuals coming before him on those marijuana cases for the most part. So that's um, extremely important. So I think that is a way, those are ways in which uh, we are addressing um, the racial equity aspect. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for you know, your, your candid responses to that question. Uh, as we think about, you know, the, the topics today, we really have to put it in the context of what is going on in Westchester, what's going on in the state in terms of the extreme racial disparities in our justice system, especially for emerging adults. And, and we heard from Judge Mendelson about the, you know, overrepresentation of this age group in, in committing crimes and being involved with the justice system. So it's all the more important. Uh, as we, you know, move through our agenda today, um, and we're, we're going to introduce another uh, presenter later on, but one of the questions to kind of set that up is what are, you know, some of the challenges and opportunities that you all are seeing with the emerging adult population? Um, you know, some key insights from Westchester, from New York State uh, that we could, you know, consider in Westchester County, uh, specifically around the challenges and opportunities. And again, this is going to be open to everyone. So please feel free to jump in whenever you feel the urge. Alison Mouse go first. Alison Mouse go first. He's letting someone else go first. So if anyone else feels the urge, go for it. Um, I'm happy to go first, but I actually, my answer was kind of going to turn it over a little bit more to, um, to, to Miko, because I think, you know, for us, um, I mean, obviously, um, there's, there's, challenges everywhere. Um, but I think what we want to try to identify is, um, you know, kind of what, what are the, um, what are the barriers to entry that we can help solve, right? Because the, the biggest problem with these programs often is if, if we can't get people to participate. And I think that's kind of an easy excuse sometimes that us prosecutors tend to use of, well, you know, we set these programs up, but no one wants to do it. And, you know, my answer to that is then we're not doing the program right. Um, we have to collaborate from the beginning um, to make sure that what we think is an, you know, a, a, um, proper, you know, standards or, or um, requirements for this program that, yeah, of course, we have to agree to it. But if it's unrealistic from a uh, person who's entering the program, a person who's getting arrested um, and, and their attorney, um, if they're going to do a cost benefit analysis and say, well, this just isn't worth it from their long term, you know, sort of perspective, then, then it's not a successful program. And so I'd love to um, hear from Tamika on that point of view and also um, Anthony Moley from my office is on who, who really deals with these kind of questions every day. So he might wanna jump in as well, but I'll turn it over to Tamika first. Josh, can you do me one favor? And I was listening to you, DA um, Roca, can you just uh, re repeat it again for me? I'm sorry. So you're talking about the question, right? Okay, so the question was around challenges and opportunities with the emerging adult population um, and some key insights from Westchester that you've seen. And I just wanna make a quick note. So for Judge Rice, if it would be great in terms of your um, portion when you respond to this, if you could just talk a little bit about some of the services that you're providing around you know, education, employment, um, mental health, and like discharge planning as well. I think that would be great in terms of giving that insight to the, to the participants here. Okay, I'm ready now. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, I, I think the challenges and when uh, I was just gonna call him Anthony, but when ABA Moley speaks, he can touch upon this as well. I think from the de defense, especially from the Legal Aid Society of Westchester's perspective, the challenge for us is, well, you know who we represent, VA Roca, and we want people to go into 
these parts. But because some of our clients are just not going to be eligible, we would love to have more of a, I don't want to say a working relationship, but more of a listening ear just a little bit for someone, for example, who may, the charge may be a verb too. It may be a verb too on paper, on paper it may. It may be a rob too on paper. But once we look through the facts, we see, hmm, this is something that we could work with. This is the type of case that we can actually work with. This is a person who may be that first time quote unquote offender. Can we work with that so that this individual does have an opportunity to work towards a goal, to get into the programs that Joanne has, the U Shelter Westchester has, and um, get a better disposition. I know my office would really um, like to discuss that in more detail. So that is a challenge for us. I can just say, I mean, I think that that's an excellent point. And, and the thing that's interesting to me is when we collaborated, Ms. Coverdale, her office, my office, on the Emerging Youth part for Mount Vernon, that was a concern that you brought to us. And so although we've kind of excluded violent uh, felonies, you did convince us to put in there but we will keep an open mind and we will look at cases on an individual basis. So I think it's an example of you advocating for your client and, and us hearing you and saying, well, we'll draw the line here, but you know, maybe the line can be erased a little bit on a case by case basis. And the other thing that I would say is, is a challenge. I mean, look, it's fantastic. We have one of these courts now in Mount Vernon. We have one in New Rochelle. I'm excited by the prospect of being able to build this out further, maybe into the other city courts. And, you know, you, you can dream about a day where potentially you could hub in from other town and village courts, let's say, like we do with the drug courts. Maybe we could hub the emerging adult population into the city courts. And uh, Judge Mendelson, maybe we'll have to call you. You may have to draft a special order for us or something to authorize that. But, you know, that's something that would be really wonderful. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just, oh, sorry. I was just going to second real quick what, what, what AJ, what Anthony said that, you know, we, we're trying in general to take a more case-by-case -case approach on, on a lot of dispositions as opposed to having these bright line rules. So um, it's, important, you know, especially since we have such a good dialogue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I think um, we do things a little bit different in New Rochelle in that um, we have it more based on availability from the service providers. So if there's somebody who is not incarcerated in New Rochelle and they have a criminal charge, what we want to do, regardless of the charge, if they're out in our community, we want to offer them these services from uh, workforce development, education, behavioral health, substance abuse standpoint, and if they want the help, then we want to provide to them. I think that what we find from a challenge is that initially you just don't know what to expect and you won't necessarily ask for that help. We find that after one or two weeks, when we have our caring adults who are working with these young people, they impress upon them that we are here for you. We are here to support you. I recognize that you are at your low moment in your life but we are not going to give up on you and ultimately love prevails. So what we do slightly different is that we use non-monetary conditions. I have an example from about a couple of weeks ago, we had a young person who came before the court with a burglary charge. And, you know, traditionally she was facing a monetary bail being set. And I listened to the district attorney's application. I listened to the defense attorney and I sliced the baby in the middle and I set non-monetary conditions for her to get one anger management and two, for her to get assessed from a uh, case management service with Westcop. And what we don't know at arraignment, where we have the district attorney who's pretty much going off with the accusatory instrument, and we have the defense attorney who had moments to speak with this person, we don't really know what's going on. And we don't know whether or not that young person who was in school prior to the arrest will get an email saying that they've been expelled from school. We don't know if that order of protection is going to require that person to be homeless. We don't know if that person will lose their job once the employer finds out what happened. And we find that time and time and time again. And this is a moment of crisis for these young people. This is the moment, the low point of their life. And we're dealing with that more often than not. And it's a time for triage. So immediately what we want to do is connect them to the services. But the challenge is 
How do we get those services in place? How are those services funded? When non-monetary conditions was implemented, they did not have a funding attribute with that. So what we do now is work with City New Rochelle. They provided some funding. We work with our state partners. We work with our nonprofit sector here in Westchester County. And when you start exploring all the various agencies, you'll learn that there's so much in your own backyard that you could tap into right away. And they are saying, please give them to me. This is my job. We need more people. And it's to the effect that I could refer people to them and have them come back and we could check up on them two weeks later, check up with them a month later. That's exactly how this process works with OYP. So it, it's more than a, a program. And it's, more, it's less of a program, it's more of a community challenge. And that's exactly what we have going on. It's a philosophy, it's an ethos, and it's a way that we want to see justice uh, in our community um, moving forward. But I will say one other challenge that I have noticed is with many of these people, there's so much friction in the community. And we're hearing all the stories, whether it's the four young ladies who beat up another young lady, or three guys with another guy, or a mother and a son, an uncle and a nephew. There are so many issues that require orders of protection and about a third of our cases do so. And my plea to everyone here today, everyone on the screen, everyone's gonna watch this uh, an hour from now, years from now, there really is an opportunity to have some more restorative justice measures here in our community. And what does restorative justice mean? That means that you look to heal relationships. You look to bring the situation back to what it was before. And I can tell you here today that orders of protection, whether it's for two years or five years, that's a really antiquated way of looking at justice and we can be doing so much better. There are other countries throughout the world. There are other times throughout our, our civilization where other methods were used. And just because we've been doing this the last 30, 40 years does not mean that we need to continue doing this. So restorative justice, there are so many opportunities. We are primed here in OYP to do that. We have the case managers, we have the police department, we have the families, we have everybody geared up and ready to sit down across from each other and figure out how can we resolve our relationship? How can we repair our relationship? How can we build and strengthen our community? And it's my plea to everyone here today that we are able to move forward in that fashion. I'll just add this because, and it has nothing to do with the question, but you raise a point that I think is important to um, highlight in spaces like this. When we are talking about the young people who are coming into our court systems, uh, our emerging adults, they may come in and today be arrested, a defendant, an accused person, and tomorrow they're the victim. So what, when you're talking about restorative justice, you know, the, it's not just here and here, the, the, the victim and the offender. Those are the terms that we like to use. What you're talking about is someone is harmed often, but the person who's harmed today, our emerging adults are, are most at risk for violence being um, inflicted against them. And what you just said reminds me of that. I'm so glad you raised restorative justice, which is so critically important. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And, you know, we are, you know, at about 4.15 right now. Our event goes till five o'clock. I want to give a little bit of an overview of what the rest of the time together is going to look like. Um, we are going to have a presentation from Kate Rubin, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. But after that, we're going to have an opportunity for the panelists to kind of respond to some of the points that Kate is making about a new piece of legislation um, in New York State Legislature. And then we will, we will move to Q&A. So the audience, you know, virtually in person will have an opportunity to ask some questions and hear from the panelists. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Ms. Kate Rubin, who is the Director of Policy and Strategic Initiatives at Youth Represent. And she is going to talk about uh, the New York State Youth Justice Opportunity Act, which WCA and, and partners across New York State are working on. Kate is one of the leaders on this uh, initiative. And, and thank you so much for being with us today. Great. Thank you so much, Josh. You all can hear me, right? Um, I'll take that over. Um, so good afternoon, I'm Kate Rubin, um, as Josh said, from Youth Represent. We're a legal services provider based in New York City. And first of all, thank you so much to Allison and Josh and WCA for organizing the event and for including, inviting me to present about the Youth Justice and Opportunity Act as part of it. Um, we are so lucky to um, 
have been partnering with you all for so long, first on Raise the Age and now on emerging adult issues among, among many others. Um, and thanks to all the panelists for your work and for the discussion. You are not an easy group to follow. So I'm gonna try to be brief and happy to answer questions um, or have follow-up conversations offline afterwards. Um, I am so excited uh, to talk to you today about the Youth Justice and Opportunity Act and about the coalition of advocates and young people that we're building to push for this legislation in Albany for the, in the coming legislative session. As you all know, we've talked about it today, we raised the age here in New York in 2017, and since the law went into effect, the vast majority of 16 and 17 year olds who are arrested in New York are sent to family court and not treated as adults, and this was a crucial step forward, but of course, starting at age 18, all New York young people are still tried as adults, still face harsh prison sentences and the devastating consequences of a criminal record. And outside of Judge Rice's part and a few programs here and there, there are so few resources or protections tailored for emerging adults um, in the system in New York. So I know I don't have to talk to this group about how this is a community health issue and a racial justice issue and about the barriers created by a criminal conviction or the enormous racial disparity in those um, barriers, which the panelists have already addressed really eloquently. So I don't need to repeat it. What I do wanna talk about are the possibilities for change under the Youth Justice and Opportunities Act. So I will walk through what the legislation does and then just take a minute to talk a little bit about the campaign and what we're doing. So as many of you know, under the current law, when a young person is being tried as an adult, as all young people again are starting at age 18, but also 16 and 17 year olds who are tried as adolescent offenders and also some very small number of kids under 16 who are tried as juvenile offenders. Um, when young people are charged as adults in New York, judges have discretion to grant youthful offender status, YO status in some cases. And when they grant YO, it has the effect of sealing the case so it doesn't show up on background checks. And it also allows judges to sentence young people to age appropriate non-jail sentences like substance abuse treatment and a wide range of other programs like the youth shelter that has been so uh, um, uh, deservedly praised many times today and, and other um, you know, programs tailored to each young person, which can also include probation. And as Judge Mendelson said, one size fits one. And all of this makes YO an incredibly powerful tool um, and really the most powerful protection we have for young people in the system. But under the current law, there are really strict restrictions, limitations on the use of YO. First, most <laughs> probably most importantly, the protections end on a young person's 19th birthday. The current law has no protections uh, for anybody over the age of you know, starting 19, they don't reflect any of the understanding of emerging adulthood that we've been talking about today. None of the science that Judge Mendelson talks about. Um, once you turn 19, there's really no um, protection. So to be specific, and uh, the, the, you know, burglary two example that Tamika raised, assuming the young person is 19 or older, um, Judge Rice has discretion to set non-monetary bail in that case because of bail reform, which is great. Um, but, but has much less discretion in terms of the disposition of the case, which is why that conversation is really with the DA's office and not with the judge. And so, you know, we think there's opportunity for judges to have more discretion there. Um, judges are also prohibited from granting YO status in certain cases, even when it would benefit the young person in the community, and this can be based on charge, can also be based on prior YO adjudications, even family court, certain family court adjudications. And finally, when a young person is eligible, YO is only automatic for a young person who's under 19 and facing their first misdemeanor conviction. So we found this to be a real problem because it means that two young people charged with the same thing might receive very different treatment based on race, also based on where their case is heard, maybe in Syracuse or the Bronx, maybe even different parts of Westchester. Um, and it also means that two young people with the same charges in New York City might receive different treatment because one is in Brooklyn and one is in Manhattan. And so just to bring it back to today's presentation, we are hearing about these incredible initiatives in Westchester and programs that are offering support to emerging adults, but we also know that there are so many counties in New York where none of these resources exist or very few exist. So what the Youth Justice and Opportunities Act would do, and this would, would uh, apply statewide, is create a new young adult status that protects young people up to age 25 
and have the same benefits and protections that youthful offender status does. And it would also expand the categories of cases where young adult status or youthful offender treatment is mandatory instead of discretionary. So it would become automatic for low level offenses like trespassing and shoplifting. And fortunately that would no longer be <clears throat> necessary for marijuana possession. Um, it would give judges more discretion to grant YO, including the option to grant YO more than once. Um, so a young person who got YO for a felony when they were 16, and now is before the court again at age 18 on a totally different case, the judge could choose to grant YO if they think it's in the interest of justice. It would create opportunities for judges to sentence young people to treatment as an alternative to incarceration. It would also allow judges to waive fees and surcharges um, for young people up to age 25. And it would have a retroactivity clause. So it would allow people who were sentenced before the law went into effect to uh, still uh, you know, gain some of the benefits and protections under it. Um, I spent this whole last summer and the last couple of months in the fall talking to young people and advocates and attorneys and service providers about this bill. And I've heard so much excitement about the legislation because the effect of it would be so tangible for so many young people. Everybody that we talk to has a story about a kid who couldn't get YO because he was arrested a few weeks after his 19th birthday or couldn't get YO on a misdemeanor because he'd already burned his YO on a felony um, or a kid who was excluded based on charges even though he you know, has finished high school and enrolled in college and working and is otherwise an incredible candidate for YO. Um, the bill is already introduced in the Assembly by Assemblymember O'Donnell and in the Senate by Senator Myrie. And we're actively recruiting co-sponsors in both houses and we're building a coalition of organizations from around the state, obviously including WCA as a lead organization and the Youth Shelter and, and many others who are here. Um, Children's Defense Fund is a, is a lead partner on it. Um, and we're holding monthly meetings. We have one actually tomorrow afternoon, but we'll have another one in November. And right now we're really in planning mode, figuring out what we need to do now to position the bill to be a priority when the legislature comes into session in January. And at that point, we'll be ramping up advocacy and really pushing legislators to pass the bill. And the final thing I wanna say is that, you know, we are realistic about the current environment that we're working in to pass the bill. For the first, I just wanna remind everybody that for the first 18 months after Raise the Age into, went into effect, gun violence remained at historically low levels. But we know that that changed after the trauma and disruptions of COVID and the lockdowns and disruptions that came with that, um, that hit young people so hard in so many ways. We know that there's backlash to reforms and that this is gonna make the terrain for advocating for more reforms harder. But we believe truly that blaming Raise the Age and other reforms for gun violence is deeply, deeply misplaced and just not supported by the data. Um, and that in fact, communities, the, for communities to heal from COVID and to rebuild economically, to get young people the support that they need, incarceration does the opposite of all those things. Um, so we are gonna need a broad statewide coalition to pass this legislation. We would need that anyway, probably in this moment, we need it even more so. Um, and we invite anyone who wants to learn more about the campaign to be in touch. I can put my information in the chat so you can contact me directly, but also through Allison and Josh, um, who again are our lead partners on this campaign. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to share the information and I will pass it back to Josh. Thank you, Kate. And you know, the, the Youth Justice Opportunity Act is, is definitely a, a follow-up and of sorts to raise the age in terms of really kind of putting it out in the legislature as a way of advancing youth justice reform. Um, so I want to just, just make a quick point that we are gonna share a one pager on the Youth Justice Opportunities Act so that people who are attending this event will be able to see more information about that. And we also will be sharing a one pager about the opportunity youth part of the newish city court. So you'll be able to see some outcomes and you know, some of the demographics and um, you know, more logistical aspects of this, this program. Um, so with that, you know, following up on Kate's uh, quick presentation, we wanna bring it back to the panel and, and think about you know, what, what might this Youth Justice Opportunities Act look like in terms of the way it would impact Westchester County uh, how do you see, you know, and, and Judge Mendelson, this might be a great kind of reframe for you, but at the state level, and as we think about the state, how is it going to impact New York State and then kind of trickle down into Westchester at more of a local level? I'll begin by going beyond the state, as I always do, at, uh, in, at least in this meeting. 
um, to let you know that those there there are many opportunities to impact the emerging adult justice population. There are um, there are specialized probation programs that we're learning about throughout the country. There are specialized corrections programs. Uh, Washington, D.C., I would uh, commend you to investigate. They were a participant in our emerging adult justice. Um, and their leadership has specialized corrections for the emerging adult population to try to transition them to full and bright lives. And there's also the concept of expungement or expanding youthful offender type statutes, not just here with your new effort that I'm, I'm happy to hear about. I think that, you know, we feel like Raise the Age must be going too smoothly. So it's time for a new Raise the Age coalition type effort, all hands on deck. Let's promote some more justice in New York State. Um, but this type of endeavor is happening in other places in the country to take a look at restrictive youthful offender laws. Vermont raised the age of criminal responsibility to 20. I mean, there are different ways um, to address these issues. So I would just commend you for uh, looking beyond, and you're right, this is a tough season to try to do any sort of justice system reform, but that doesn't stop us. We, did, we were moving for Raise the Age well before anyone was ready for it, and it took us a long time. Um, so I will say that, speaking as a judge, now I'm putting on, that was my national, take a look at the research, go to the Columbia Justice Lab's website, and they'll talk about all of the various types of interventions, including expanding youthful offender type statutes that are going on around the country that you can learn about. But putting on my judge hat, I will tell you most judges appreciate more opportunities to use their discretion um, than the man. Am I right, judge? <laughs> It doesn't mean that they overuse it, and of course, everyone has the opportunity to be heard in every courtroom, but having more tools to address and to individuate and to provide the proper response, I think, would be appreciated um, with this endeavor. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, one, the Youth Justice Opportunity Act, I'm a word guy. You, you nailed it with that, so I love <laughs> the words, love that opportunity theme. I think that that's a theme that we need to use and have permeated through our society because what we are literally talking about is just leveling the playing field, right? And what we find today is that when a young person gets a criminal record, what we do is we either send them on probation or they get incarcerated and then they're done and they have this badge of inferiority for life. And we'd say, go out and get a job and go out and don't get in trouble again. And who cares if you get discriminated against? Who cares if you can't get employment? Who cares if you can't get housing? And all these collateral consequences occur just because of this criminal conviction, and especially when we're talking about a 20-year-old or a 21-year-old, we understand the brain science today, we understand how impulsive young people are, we understand trauma that brings them to do different things, and as I said before, broken people break things. So to have discretion to look into all these circumstances and see wh who do we really want to have criminal records and what are criminal records for, and what purpose do they serve for a young person when they're 30, 40 years old? I grew up with many people and they have criminal records today, and I see how hard life can be for them, and they don't have those same advantages and opportunities that I have um, because they have this one criminal record and things spiraled out of control. We're seeing that in our OIP right now, where we are doing our very best to prevent them from having criminal records. I think that the incarceration piece is a piece that we're all working on. Bail reform was front and center with that, but this next step, the next stage, is to see what we can do around the issues of criminal records. It's not an issue that's discussed. It's not an issue that's widely known, but it, it, people will be shocked to learn how many people are actually coming out of courses with criminal records who don't necessarily need one, right? So that's my two cents. Okay. On Zoom, any, any thoughts on this? I just wanted to say um, thank you so much, uh, Kate, for uh, Thank you so much, Kate, for providing that information to us. You know, as a criminal defense agency, we are always interested um, in important information such as this. The Rage the Age was extremely positive and it did uh, assist, you know, many of those younger people who are um, accused. So we are excited about the possibilities here. So thank you so much. Okay, any, any final thoughts? Because we are, we are ready in terms of the time to move to questions and answers, but I wanna just make sure 
all of our panelists have their final word before we get to that. Any other thoughts before we move on to, to Q&A? Um, all right, I think we are ready. So I'm going to pass it to my colleague and WCA's Executive Director, Allison Lake, who is going to handle the Q&A portion for the in-person uh, people participating in person and then my colleague, Lynn Marie Cabrera, who is our Director of Data Operations and Finance, will handle the virtual Q&A. And we encourage you, if you are virtual, to put your questions in the chat, and we will make sure to ask them to our panelists. You want to come closer? Um, so I want to add my thanks and appreciation before we get to Q&A to all of our panelists. Um, you know, I've, I've known some like Judge Rice for a long time, um, and, and others have certainly got to, to meet and engage with as we've embarked on this youth justice work for um, WCA. And I, when we were thinking of putting this event together and trying to think who was going to be in the room, I wanted inspiration, I wanted, you know, information and, and hard facts and, and research. I wanted those that are on the, the front line, um, you know, the DA and, and the legal services to really give us kind of the, the full picture of what we are dealing with. And so I want to add my voice to Josh and just saying this is just the beginning. It's an opening conversation. We obviously need more. We need to dig deeper into some of these areas. But as Kate has said, as we are gearing up for a, a difficult legislative session, we at WCA thought it's important, think it's important to give people as many tools and information as possible so that you too can join in our advocacy um, efforts. So with that, I'm going to turn to our guests here in the room um, for questions and um, Limery from WCA is on Zoom and sort of monitoring the chat. So if you are virtual, please put your questions in the chat and we will try to um, summarize those that, that overlap some. But, but we do, we, even though we started a little late, I think we are in good time, we made up some time. And so we certainly wanna get to as many questions as possible and have the conversation. And so I do have a hand raised here in the room, so we'll start. Can you just move a little closer to the because Zoom can't see Come over. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Oh, please, yes, ask your question. Oh, thank you for holding this. Yes. Dr. Michelle Garvey, and I've been an administrator for 20, a chief branch manager for 25 years. 20 years we spent as an administrator, and two, three of the best years I spent at Westchester County Department of Correction. I was a principal after school at the Westchester County Department of Correction. Ironically, because of great age, I was moved out because we had no more students there. I wasn't that to be a problem. But in everything that you heard, I know when I learned from I have no experience in legal, except for so on and order. But what I learned from the annual part of being through the system and being in the system with my students is that education is a big piece of this and also wraparound services because regardless of what we did in the facility, we worked with our kids by the time of up, we had 80%. Um, HSC, that's the new word for GED, the new term for GED, we had an 80% graduation rate. Meaning we had students who were actually going on state for 20 years plus who did get their HSC because we were able to work with them on trauma-informed instruction, social emotion, life skills. So, but everything we did, even the ones who left, once they leave, they kept a connection with me for about a month. And then after that, like Judge Wright said, they go back to their neighborhoods. They go back to doing what they've always done. So my connection is completely Laws, and I'm no longer in education because of my work with the District County Department of Correction. I want to do more with social justice and our students because when I come also when I'm talking to them and in education, when I meet them, I would say, um, you know, how are you on the principal? I never met a principal when I wasn't in trouble. So they are already being penalized by in school. Most of them dropped out by the time they were in eighth grade because you get ninth grade regions stop them. The mental illness, the drug addiction, and the students with IDs, students with disabilities. So you put all of that together, and we have a high rate of black and, his, black and Hispanic students. They were students to me, um, in these CEOs, but they were students, they are students to me. So I want to know what can we do from an educational point of view, and literally, how can I help to do something? Is 
that is honestly one of my passions. And once I hear that, I go, this is what I need to do. So what can we do to help that? Oh, those of us in education, with those connections, with those networks, with 25 years of experience, how can I help with what we do? Can I just say, uh, the people on Zoom did not hear the question, so okay. whoever is responding first, please repeat it so okay. that they can hear it. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll repeat the, the, the question, which has to do about the importance of education, young people that are justice involved. Um, and so I guess we're sharing the fact that young people, when they were incarcerated, working towards the GED or working towards college credits, and then once they are sort of out of the system, that often comes to an end and recognizing the importance of education to change that sort of trajectory. And so um, Judge Benjamin, I think I'll start with you, as you said, in that, in your national, you know, research that you understand and even across the state, how can we do better at giving young people the sort of educational um, resources that they may need if they've never finished? I know from the Opportunity Court in, in New Rochelle, the percentage of young people who did not, who are arrested, who don't have a, you know, high school diploma and going upstream sort of, if you will, how can we do better with the educational piece? So my answer will not be an answer. We don't have a quick answer to that, but what you said about education being key is critically important. And we have it with the questions that were asked, had the opportunity to mention that. So I'm deeply glad that you're in the room, um, doctor, um, uh, to give us that perspective. Education is key. And when I tell you, when we're talking about prevention me measures, um, as, as, as our defense attorney was talking about prevention, we want to catch people before they're arrested. This is the opportunity to say prevention happens from the cradle. We have to have a, 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 a well-funded Department of Education, well-funded schools, well-resourced schools, after-school programs. We're talking about from the very beginning within our communities because by the time they get these young people get to become incarcerated and use an educator or trying to catch up for years when they've been pushed out of class and not respected in class and not actually able to talk, be taught because of the individualized educational needs they may have. It's late. And I know you, you, your opportunity youth part is working with a local, I believe a community college that is taking these young people in and helping them um, catch up. But I, want us to stop catching up and start from the beginning and educate our children appropriately from the start. So that's why my answer is not an easy answer. Yeah, no, We've right. got more to do. Yeah, but you've right. got to catch her. Yes, yes. Right. Well, put let's her on a subcommittee to lead your <laughs> educational. <laughs> your educational subcommittee leader and get the educators yes, in the yes. room. Yes, we, 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 we know how that goes. Once, once you come in to WCA, you're, you're in. But I, I, I did write that down and I want to add too, Another piece that Kate and I know other folks around the state have been involved with, as you said, in terms of the prevention piece, but is looking at legislation that allows students to be suspended. Because again, if we're kicking them out of school, there's no way that they're going to get the degree that they need to then move further. And so all of this is, is related and WCA has been involved with many other partners in the solutions, not suspensions piece of legislation as well, because we need to keep kids in well-resourced schools and in out of school supports and services as well. So um, appreciate that and we will connect definitely. Any other questions I, um, from the room? Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just um, as Judge Middles said, it is a cradle to career approach. We want to make sure kids are entering school ready to learn. We want to make sure at that third grade level that they're reading at grade level because that is a huge indicator of where they will be educationally down the line, whether or not they'll be inclined to drop out of school by the time they reach 11th grade. One of our huge success stories is a young man who dropped out of high school, got arrested. We sent him to the case management, we identified where he was, we reconnected him with the school, he got in high school, he graduated within a, a period of months. That is, he's one of our all-stars today, and we're gonna see him in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and we need people to motivate these young people. So what I would do with you, if you live in New Rochelle or anywhere around, I would reach out to you when we walk out of here town, grab my arm and say, do you want a mentor? Because you sound like you would be an amazing mentor. What do you do to motivate these young people? <laughs> what they need is somebody to stay yes. on top of them. Yes. The resources, believe it or not, are, are largely out there in Westchester. West, Westchester is a resource-rich area. We have Westchester Community College. We have a high school equivalency program whereby you could take college credits, the first 24 credits, get your high school equivalency, pick up at that point, 
and move on to matriculation and get a, an associate's degree at 60 credits. We have a plethora of GED programs. We have nice, we have all these programs, but the young people sometimes need to be better incentivized and better motivated. So it takes the community aspect, it takes the mentor. We found that the mentor component has been the secret sauce to kind of get them to wake up a little bit faster than they need to be. So I really learned that certainly follow up. I want to make sure that we get to some other questions, but certainly those of us that have been doing child advocacy or child development know that critical adult connection. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be family. And many times it's not for a young person can really make a difference. And so the mentorship, I think, is huge. Before I go to uh, you, Lim, on Zoom, I just want to see if there's any other questions from folks in the room here also be mindful of time. So why don't we start, Liv, if you have a question that you want to um, throw out. Okay, um, I have a question from Pat White and uh, I believe this is really uh, for DA Roca um, because the question appeared while DA Roca was speaking. Uh, can we talk more on the females in the juvenile justice system? What does the data look like for them and families and young moms? Um, so that's a great question and one that I'm going to have a very unsatisfying answer to because um, it's kind of a joke here in my office that since I got here, I am constantly asking for data on things. I think AJ and, and Lila who are on can attest to that. And as of right now, we don't have a lot. Um, one of the things that I've tried to look at as an example, this is a little bit different because it's on the, the victim side, but you know, it, it's a similar concept. I wanted to know, you know, how many sex complaints that sex assault complaints that come in are actually end up in um, being completed cases or not. We don't have that data right now. So this this is the infrastructure basically that um, I'm trying to help develop in this office. Um, and, you know, I think on the um, racial equity side, we've been more focused on it, but your point is an excellent one that we need to be as focused on it in terms of um, gender inequities. And it's something that, that I, I try to talk about in, in unison. Um, you know, I think that it's fortunately a smaller population. I mean, anyone in criminal justice and law enforcement will will tell you that. Um, obviously, you know, the, the number of women, young women in particular, interacting with the criminal justice system is smaller, but it's not at all non-existent. And they do face a definitely unique set of um, obstacles and biases and problems that are just not often enough um, talked about. So it's, it's something, again, that we're trying to be more um, conscious of and deliberate about. And I do think this is an area where data, once we are able to um, collect it, will be eye-opening for a lot of people who don't think it's an issue right now. Thank you. I know Judge Mendelson wanted to add. Just adding that um, Supreme Court Justice Kathy Davidson from Westchester County, who is now the Dean of our Judicial Institute, created a girls remarkable um, um, girls court. Uh, it was called GRIP, 
probably girls' responsive intervention part. I'm going to make it up. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> is the name of the court part. But I do know that, and that was unique in Westchester County. Once again, and this is something I would recommend for you all as well, take advantage of the researchers at your universities. Um, they support the work because we should also be tracking what we're doing in these interventions to making sure they're having the, um, making sure they're having the um, outcomes that we're looking for. So try. Just really brief, um, we have uh, uh, some initial data, some implementation data from OYP, and we found that uh, it's a three to one ratio with males to females. And really interestingly of that data, and I'm gonna give a shout out to our court coordinator, Colleen Gardafi, who's working with us from CPCI. Uh, we found that of the participants, of the female participants, 60% of the female participants have charges with co-defendants versus 15% with the males. And of all the data that we, that we looked at, that is the most striking data. And we're still trying to unpack that and figure it out. We had a conversation at our last court session, these Thursday court sessions that we have is turning into, you know, we, we're really smart people and we're learning from each other and we, we're trying to analyze these things, but they're more involved with groups and peers and peer pressure and whether they're assault charges or petty larceny charges, they're doing them in tandem. And that's something that the guys aren't doing necessarily. So that's something just to look into as we move forward. It's, it's a huge data point. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention my lovely wife who's in the audience with me. I don't want to get it. That's right. Do it right. Okay, good. And I'm glad because I was going to mention Judge Davidson in the grip court here as well. And um, your, your point is well taken about using our local researchers to help us to analyze the data that we are um, gathering and we will unearth, I'm sure, new things that we're not thinking of. So, Lim, do you have another question for us? I have to say, I, I like, feel like a game show host. Lim, do you have another question for us? <laughs> okay, yes. Um, I have a question from Renee Fogarty. Um, what influence is the general public having on the push for better solutions for youth justice? Are the panelists hearing strong just re strong requests for reform and are there naysayers? Hmm. Kate, you want to start with that one? Kate, prove it. I'm just curious. Because you, you know, you sort of said it and Judge Mendelson too. This is going to be a difficult year. I mean, part of the reason that WCA um, does round tables and town hall meetings is to get the information out to educate um, those who do not, you know, work in this environment on a daily basis so that they will mobilize with us and talk to decision makers and elected officials to say, we want this done. Yes, we know it's difficult. Yes, we know, you know, these are complex issues, but we want to move forward with it. Um, but maybe you have some other specifics to share, Kate, maybe from other places around the state. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is like a huge appetite for reform from around the state. I think that, you know, and, and I, again, like we've, um, Julia Davis from Children's Defense Fund and I spent a good part of last year doing focus groups with young people and also service providers. And, um, you know, we also have, have talked to just like dozens and dozens of people as we've been building this campaign. and. I think there is a lot of um, there's a, a a lot of appetite for further reform and definitely a growing understanding about um, emerging adulthood and young adults and um, I, I think and and an understanding that you know raise the age was an important step but that there's you know there's eight in in New York City we have 18 year olds at Rikers Island um, and 19 year olds. I mean, we are not, we are so far from done working on youth justice in, in New York. So I think there's there's a lot of, and, and in terms of the need, like that we need sort of everybody, you know, it is definitely, as Judge Mendelson said, at all hands on deck, we need, um, you know, I think we're gonna need people in every corner of the state meeting with elected officials, in some cases, not even because there's opposition, but just because there's so many different issues, right, on everybody's agenda. There's so much going on, especially now coming, hopefully we'll, we will be emerging from this pandemic in the next months and year. Um, so there's just so many different issues on everybody's agenda and making this one, and, and, and to be totally honest, like young people in the criminal legal system are often not high on any of the agendas of any of the big kind of interest groups that are doing a lot of lobbying and getting a lot of attention in Albany and with the legislature. So I think there's a really big need to just do organizing and have a presence and, and hold those meetings and, um, 
and to sort of raise the profile of these issues. There's absolutely naysayers. I mean, I think that so far there, I'm hearing very vocal naysayers from a, a small but loud contingent. Um, from my perspective in the city, it's like amplified through the New York Post, um, but that's, it's not coming from every corner. Um, you know, but I think there are naysayers and there's also people who are understandably really, really, really deeply concerned about what feels like a lot of precarity in the city right now. Um, and, and I'm sure around the state also, and, and I don't live in Westchester, but you know, Westchester folks can speak to that. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's a really our job to keep grounding people in the reality that that precarity has been with us because of inequality um, and racism. Um, and it also is really deepened by COVID and that COVID um, both deepened those equalities and also shed the light on them in ways that I think people found unsettling. Um, and that, that we have to reckon with all of that, but that the way to reckon with it is to is to both do the reforms that need to be done and also I mean that there was this conversation was great about investing in communities and, and all the whole wide range of investments that communities need and then making those resources really available to everybody in communities and, and not just the people who sort of already have them. Great, you too. Um, I think Lim, we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Are there some themes that you're noticing in the questions? I have two questions left. So, okay. um, and one is such a perfect wrap up question that I'm going a little out of order here. Um, but we have another question about data, so I can't leave that alone. Uh, the, from Claire Hurst, uh, the question is, is there any data at the county level tracking females entering the judicial system who are victims of trafficking? And how does this consideration factor into sentencing? Um, so I'm not aware of any data that's being collected right now at the um, county level mm -hmm. on this issue. I, I, I will say this, um, I, I don't think it's just a matter if we're talking about anyone who is a victim or even potentially a victim of trafficking of it coming into account at sentencing. It should come into account when we're talking about whether or not we're going to prosecute. And my view is that if someone is a victim of trafficking, um, we would not bring criminal charges against them because they're a victim. And that was true when I was working as a federal prosecutor um, as well. And our office, I, I as a federal prosecutor and, and our office um, as well through Fred Green, the head of our special prosecutions division, is very involved in the Westchester Anti-Trafficking Task Force, which is a, a wonderful task force. Um, and one of the things that that task force has been very focused on for years is working with law enforcement across this county to train them, to work with them, to train them, to make sure that they are able to um, identify those signs of trafficking. I mean, sometimes it's obvious, but a lot of times it's not. And um, I would like to think that most of those cases are not even making it to our office as arrests on criminal prosecutions, because I think law enforcement here, especially if you compare it to a lot of law enforcement around the county is really, um, you know, sensitive to this, to this issue here in large part because of the task force. But if such cases did make it to our office, we would not be prosecuting them criminally. So I don't even think it's a question of how does that get taken into account in sentencing? I will say, um, and, and I failed to mention this in the earlier question about, about um, young women and girls in the criminal justice system, you know, obviously a lot of them who do come to us are um, young women who are acting in response to not just trafficking, but domestic violence situations. And that is something where, again, it should be taken into consideration in prosecution, but also in sentencing. And there now is New York state legislation that allows us to um, allows them to apply for uh, basically reductions in their sentencing if it, if it was um, done, uh, in, if, if, for example, they, they killed their um, abuser um, after a, a abusive relationship. So I think there is a lot of development in this area, but, you know, look, not enough and not a lot. And it's something that we as a criminal justice system need to 
focus on much more. Um, AJ, I don't know if you have anything to add on the trafficking question or. I, I did, I just wanted to add on the trafficking piece, you know, we try to be keenly aware of it. So when we look at cases where we think the, the female might potentially or even possibly be the victim of trafficking, either because of the nature maybe between she and a co-defendant or, or maybe there is no co-defendant, but we have reason to suspect it, we will uh, affirmatively reach out to defense counsel and try to have uh, defense counsel broach that with the defendant and try to then see in a safe space if there are those types of issues so that we can deal with them you know, head on. So we, we'll, we'll affirmatively try to identify them and do outreach. Thank you. Uh, Lim, final question. Final question. Um, this is from Tambria Terry. Uh, she says, this has been wonderfully informative. What support can lay people, community residents provide engage in? Uh, so one, thank you. For, this has been an amazing event. Thank you so much. I'm so gracious to be here with the wonderful panelists and the guests that we've had with the questions. And I think that um, what we want to do is turn this into a community issue. I think that the court system needs to be a little more open, um, more unconventional, more untraditional, more innovative as to allowing the community to take part in the solutions because lawyers and court personnel are not going to be able to do it by themselves. And that's the fact. So with that, I want to end on an analogy with thermometers and thermostats. They both are similar instruments, they both do similar things, but the thermometer is more or less just gonna be in a room and tell you what the temperature is, it's gonna to react to its surroundings. A thermostat has the ability to turn the temperature up or down. We need to be a community of thermostats. We need to turn the temperature up when needed and it may push people out of the comfort zone, but you know what, that's okay. Our young people are depending on us to be a community of thermostats. Thank you so much for, for, for having this wonderful conversation. You better let that be the last one. I, I, you know, I, I was <laughs> trying to round out, but I think that, I think, I think that is it. Um, so, and, and we, we are right on time. want to be mindful of time. So let me just um, thank everyone. Thank our panelists, Judge Weiss and Judge Mendelson for coming to join us in, in person. Yay, Roca, thank you. Um, Tamika, thank you for representing the Legal Services Society of Westchester and, and Kate. It's the Legal Aid Society of Westchester. Legal Aid Society, Sarah, sorry, Legal Aid Society and, and Kate for being just a great state partner um, and sharing, like that, all our, our panelists. I want to give a shout out to Josh, who is here in my office, who uh, arranged this with our interns to give them a big um, hand again. And I would just say, in, in my kind of response to, as you said, Lynn, great final question, as we have been saying all along, we need the public to advocate with us to better understand the issues, um, to ground people in reality, I think you said, Kate, you know, when you hear the pushback from what people are seeing sometimes on the six o'clock news or on the front page of a paper. Um, I was fortunate to sit in on uh, the Opportunity Court with Judge Rice over, over the summer where you had the young person, <laughs> you know, not, not to divulge too much, but literally the young person was at work and responding <laughs> to your questions and to your, to your check-in. And I have to just say, it, it really brought tears to my eyes because this was a young person that given the opportunity, given the work, was there, was doing the job, doing the hard work, but the mentor was also there to shore him up and say, you know, yep, you're doing a great job and, and we're here for you. Um, and any of us that, that have children or nieces and nephews, this is what we do for the children in our lives all the time. And so we just need to continue to do it for all the children in Westchester and even beyond in terms of the state. So again, thank everyone for coming. Please, if you're not um, connected to WCA via social media, we are, at WCA for Kids. Um, and if you don't get our e-blast, you can go to our website and sign up. That's the best way to stay engaged, stay involved, so that you will hear the next opportunity around mobilization and engagement that we need for emerging youths, but really all of our young people. So thank you all again. Have a great evening and stay tuned for the next. This is just the beginning. So thank you so much.